Welcome back to the APSCC 2021 webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Today, we are looking at uh, the operators, the third in our ongoing operators roundtables today with an Asian focus. Uh, joining us as the moderator for our session today, Virgil Labrador, uh, the editor-in-chief of Satellite Markets and Research Magazine. Virgil's based in LA, but previously he was here in Asia uh, in, in, as a, running a teleport. Uh, so uh, as a journalist, his questions have a particularly practical bent. Uh, and fielding those questions today, Christian Patero, the CEO of Casific. Uh, we also have Pak Adi Aliwoso from PSN and Daniel Kim from KTSAT, providing a perspective from North Asia. Uh, so please... Uh, do enjoy uh, enjoy today's session and uh, thank all of them for for being here today well thank you chris for that introduction for those of you who don't know me again my name is virgil labrador i'm editor-in-chief of uh, satellite markets and research we publish the uh, satellite executive briefing magazine a monthly magazine at the website satellitemarkets.com so today's topic is uh, the satellite industry's post-covid financial environment but this won't be a very uh, financial type of uh, session, actually. Finances means both, you know, uh, revenues and uh, investments. So we will talk about uh, how the satellite industry has fared, uh, specifically from the perspective of our distinguished panel today, uh, how they fared during the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and how they see themselves getting out of this and what was the satellite industry and their companies in particular look uh, post-pandemic. So we have uh, uh, Adi Adiwoso, he's the President Director of PC Satellite Nusantara uh, from Indonesia. Uh, uh, PSN or Pacific Satellite Nusantara as well as the first commercial uh, satellite operator in uh, Indonesia. It started way back in the early uh, 1990s uh, and uh, Adi is very well known in the industry. We also have Daniel Kim. He's the uh, head of the uh, managing director of the global business of uh, KTSAT, the Korean satellite operator. And uh, finally, last but not least, we have Christian Patoro. He's the CEO, president and CEO of us. I think you could still call it a startup company, uh, or, or but it's already launched its uh, first satellite, the uh, K-Pacific, Pacific, or, or Pacific. So... Uh, First of all, let me just uh, set it all up uh, before we, I ask these uh, distinguished gentlemen to give uh, brief introductory remarks. Um, the, the global pandemic is the worst that the world has suffered in about 100 years. But the satellite industry uh, seems to have fared quite well. You know, there was a bunch of uh, um, well-known bankruptcies uh, like Intelsat and OneWeb and Speedcast, among others. Uh, but all of those have already come back now and have uh, kind of uh, uh, re-established themselves uh, post-bankruptcy. Uh, now, in uh, satellite markets and research, we actually track, you know, uh, certain stocks. Uh, we call it the Satellite Market Index. We publish it monthly in our magazine. And uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, the... the Satellite market index is actually faring very well in comparison to the S&P 500, uh, almost at the same toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with it in terms of percentage. And as we all know, the S&P 500 has actually done very well uh, during the pandemic. It's actually worth much, much more now than it was at the start. And as you can see from this slide, uh, you know, looking just from uh, the beginning of the year, uh, January of 2021, Almost all the companies have, have increased the, their value since. There's a few outliers, one or three, uh, but, but more or less the, major, the great majority, over three-fourths of them are doing very, very well. So that's the uh, big picture. Now for the, uh, for the actual, uh, at the, on the ground level, we we'll have here, uh, as I said again, the very distinguished panelists from a very good uh, representation of companies here. We have uh, long-established companies in Korea and uh, in Indonesia and, uh, and, and a relatively new, newer company who started just before or launched their satellite just before the pandemic. So uh, let me start with uh, uh, Adi Adiwoso. So Adi, could you uh, give us an update on your company uh, and uh, how, do you, how did you fare during the pandemic and how do you see it uh, going forward? Thank you, Virgil. Basically, uh, PSN, which is operating in 
uh, Southeast Asia, but mainly in Indonesia. Uh, during the pandemic, because everything will be done online, uh, we actually see a much greater requirement uh, for space capacity uh, for during the pandemic. And that accelerates also the need of the country to establish uh, uh, internet communications across the nation. So there are some endeavor by the government uh, which consists of building fiber optics, uh, which has been done, and also uh, using as many satellites as possible to stop gap before the fiber optics is spread out. But at the end of the day, satellite has a very good place in our, our country. I think Indonesia today has uh, dried up all the capacity, whether domestic or international space capacity over Indonesia. And I think uh, one institution under the government called Bhakti is now probably in process of using more than 30 gigabits per second capacity totally. So in that sense, uh, a little bit different than everybody else, we actually uh, are feeling that the growth is as much as possible. We just don't have more capacity, either in PSM or other things. And now that's the reason that uh, the government is launching the SMF program, which is a PPP, to reduce the 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 the, uh, the uh, what's called the capacity shortage shortage in Indonesia. So it's been actually a very good uh, uh, situation compared to some other uh, situation in the world, uh, since we do not. Uh, provide any mobility services or any global services. These are basically for rural areas, and that has been now a challenge. Now the the, 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 the plan is there and being executed. So, uh, it, contrary to everybody expected, uh, I think we're doing quite well. Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, we'll get back to that in greater detail about uh, your plans for the future. Uh, I know you have a satellite that's coming up uh, as well. Uh, meanwhile, let's hear from uh, Daniel Kim from KTSAT. Yeah, uh, probably I need to uh, introduce uh, KTSAT first. Uh, KTSAT is a uh, uh, satellite subsidy of uh, uh, KT Group. Uh, KT is which is number one uh, telecommunication business group in South Korea. We uh, actually became more active in uh, Southeast Asia market since uh, 2017 when we have uh, the coverage extended to the full of Asia region. So during the pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, actually, for uh, KTCS perspective, we have uh, achieved uh, our performance goals in most business area, similar to the Eddie's comments last year, except uh, one area that uh, relatively large drop in uh, revenue uh, of occasional broadcasting service, which is related to the you know various events which were on on the whole during pandemic or cancelled. Also, there are some, you know, a uh, couple of uh, project delay in some uh, system integration project of a government side or maybe overseas project, which is due to the, the lockdown situation out there. But, you know, governments and military business or uh, full-time uh, broadcast service, which account for our majority of uh, revenue, still well performed last year. So in case of maritime, you know, business area or so, the majority of our customer are merchant and shipping vessels, which is not uh, such as affected. Uh, and so there is no uh, concern about IFC business because we do not yet, you know, provide such a solution uh, uh, to the market yet. Uh, but, you know, overseas business uh, due to the uh, travel limitation, the initial challenges were actually uh, there but gradually, uh, gradually being adapted, uh, but uh, developing new opportunity and finding new customers are relatively very limited and still difficult these days, you know, without travel or uh, direct contact to the customer. But we actually, we had did a good job last year. We achieved a majority of our, you know, target revenue, uh, but we had to try to maintain our business uh, sustainable by additional opportunity or additional bandwidth requirement from our existing customer. For example, in Philippines, uh, we have um, customer uh, needs, uh, you know, uh, uh, needs to provide a capacity for their, you know, 3G to transition to LTE. 
with uh, maybe three times uh, larger capacity than before uh, previous existing supplier. So we um, did uh, the provide the capacity and uh, the project implemented very well with our one of the clients uh, in the Philippines. Also, we have seen you know uh, uh, the number of the the DTS subscribers in the Philippines is increased a lot last year to from the one of the DTH big player there. So we had to provide additional capacity to for them to increase the number of HD, HD channels and stuff like that. So, uh, but anyway, um, overseas uh, business was good, but. But we are still, you know, because stage in fact without, you know, travel and uh, contacting customer. Mm -hmm. but we believe that, you know, uh, this uh, uh, remote you know, effort toward customers before returning to the normal life will not affect uh, the current situation right now because the last year performance was that actually given from the, the, the year before. So, which is a result of the, um, but the performance of the uh, this year, uh, our activities will affect next year, which is not this year. So we will need to uh, try to overcome uh, the situation because the satellite industry especially will need a long lead time for the, to win the project. And so we will be aware about that much uh, on that our activity this year. Moving on to uh, Christian. Yes, uh, thank you, Virgil. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so Pacific uh, operates the first uh, full K band uh, high throughput satellite over Southeast Asia and uh, the Pacific Island. We we uh, launched our satellite in December 2019, uh, and it came into operations commercial operation around February uh, 2020. Um, so just just at the time all the lockdowns were happening. So needless to say, it was a fairly difficult time for us to enter uh, into uh, the commercial phase of our, of our project, of our business um, during that, that phase, um, which in, in a sense was also an opportunity for us because it, it uh, forced us to rethink our business model a bit, um, you know, from, from scratch and, uh, and, and in a hurry. Um, because uh, there were severe structural rigidities in the in the value chain during the lockdown uh, that lasted, I would say, until about June uh, 2020. Um, so the at that point, uh, the business started to pick up again on the original business plan, which was more a wholesale business plan. But in parallel, we had started also a retail uh, model that uh, we had kind of reinvented during that, that phase, that difficult phase. And both uh, model have coexisted since and uh, have grown nicely. Um, so, I mean, I, what, what we've observed um, in the later, um, the later months of 2020 is that there was a very strong resiliency of of the um, you know the satellite industry generally of the demand um, you know it's especially because people needed internet you know before and and during and after the pandemic and uh, and probably the pandemic will leave the world with uh, more demand uh, generally uh, from people working from home um, so our business has picked up nicely um, we. We have now, um, you know, uh, answered different tenders to resellers in different countries. Our main focus at the moment, where we, we put, we have put most of our bandwidth, is uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand. Um, so those are the, the most uh, the, the markets that grow the fastest at the moment. Um, and you know what we see today is a bit like Adi mentioned. We we see a, a, a scarcity of, of supply in, in Indonesia, for instance. Um, we see that governments, especially the government of Indonesia, as well as Philippines, have taken matters in their own hands to make sure that, um, you know, that uh, the pandemic or, or, you know, if it was to last for a, a longer period of time, wouldn't would have uh, minimal impact on 
connectivity on exchanges of information and goods. Uh, and therefore, you know, governments need satellite for that. Uh, and they need to put more emphasis on their rural and remote areas. Uh, and so the business is doing so well that uh, we have decided to actually start the procurement of our second satellite already. Uh, so we are well into that phase. Uh, we hope to soon be able to make some announcement on, on, that, on that front. Right. So thank you, Christian. Uh, that's a pretty good overview of uh, your companies now you did in the pandemic and your plans. Now let's get into a little bit more detail. Now, nothing says optimism than uh, investing in new satellites. As we all know, satellites are a major investment. The, you know, uh, it costs a lot to manufacture, launch, and there's a long lead time for it. So Adi, uh, you're working on a, a satellite right now. Uh, so are you, uh, Christian? Uh, how about Korea Set? Are you, or uh, Katie Set? Are you planning uh, uh, any satellites soon, or, or do you have anything in the works? Yeah, actually, we are uh, considering uh, various uh, business options, uh, preparing for our future. Some of them maybe may include uh, vertical integration by uh, acquisition of some of the companies, startup leading companies. Mm -hmm. And or manufacturing of uh, state of art uh, VH test new system upon you know a software defined payload or flexible coverage to prepare the future demand from our customer, especially over Southeast Asia. As well as um, we are also considering the strategic uh, partnership with uh, maybe one of the uh, LAO operators, which are. Mm -hmm. expected to bring uh, business continuity and uh, future growth in the future. So uh, according to our um, recent uh, you know, market study uh, with uh, one of the uh, global uh, research group, it shows that many over, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, the capacity demand will be at least, uh, I guess, 15 to maximum 40 times more than the existing capacity demand in uh, about uh, 10 years. So for example, Indonesia is going to be 40 times gross from existing 25 gigabps to uh, one terabps. Mm -hmm. And for example, Malaysia approximately 15 times gross from existing 10 gigabps, 157 gigabps. Um, in Indo uh, Philippines is going to be approximately 30 uh, times growth from existing six, six gigabps in one. 71 uh, gigabps in um, 10 years time frame. So we still see a lot of growth and explosive uh, uh, data you know, market over those uh, Southeast, uh, three major Southeast uh, country. So we, uh, we are trying to do, uh, you know, the continue to our business growth with a new, you know, uh, system will be launched soon uh, in a couple of years. Will be uh, the formation of, uh, the additional payload on the our uh, replacement system of uh, 1166 6A or either maybe have a new full you know a VHT system VHT VHT system based on KA band uh, spectrum which will be uh, filing into ITU right Adi, talk about a little more detail about uh, the satellite that you're working on now with the Indonesian government uh, is it Nusantara Tiga right yeah, we, we call it Nusantara Tiga, the government call it Satria 1. Satria 1. Uh, so basically, the satellite capacity is about 150 gigabits per second. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, 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 will be launched in the first half of 2023. Mm -hmm. And it has 11 gateways. Uh, we have world-class uh, supplier to do that. So we have SpaceX as the launcher. We have Talos as the spacecraft manufacturer. We have HNS as the uh, hub provider. And we also have Kratos to give us the monitoring and network monitoring capabilities. And we have New on China for the antenna. So it's a very international uh, uh, supplier chain. Uh, as well as the financing has been closed uh, and already disbursed, coming from Europe, from BPI, coming from Asia, from AIIB in Beijing, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, 
uh, supported by European banks, Santander, Korean Development Bank, as well as uh, um, HSBC. Uh, that basically uh, allows us to finish the uh, full financing the whole thing. Uh, the government is using many satellite today as an interim solution because they see the growth. But this 150 gigabit per second is uh, going to be there available in 2023 late. Mm -hmm. But uh, the price point that the government is asking is actually very, very challenging. Uh, the contract is now less than $100 per megabit per second per month. I think it's going to be uh, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, so that is a benchmark uh, that the government will do uh, once uh, the satya is up, if there is any other capacity requirement. So they're very smart. Uh, and that, that put a pressure to all of us for future generations to look at the economics very well. Uh, but it allows us to, to basically have 150 gigabit per second plus what we ever have. And also, we had a failure, launch failure last uh, 2000, last year in April. April, right? Yeah, the Lucenta 2 uh, from uh, Great Wall. Uh, we're working on a replacement for that and looking at the situation that the government is setting up the same amount of uh, prices. It is a challenging project uh, due to the fact that today uh, everybody is still not reaching the dollar gigabits per second capex where it needed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, without secure contract, I don't think it will be uh, financially viable. The only reason we were able to do on the Satya project because it's an off-take agreement, but the government, they won 100%. So that, that is no ramping up. If you have no ramping up, we cannot meet those prices. So, but it's an interesting because uh, uh, right now uh, we're supplying as many as as our all our capacity basically done now on end one. Uh, we have no capacity. Maybe maybe less than a transponder uh, left. Uh, everything has been taken. So uh, we have to find a solution for PSM as well beyond the Satriga uh, solution. So that's where we are, and uh, Indonesia is still a very hot market. But uh, for anyone coming in, uh, Bhakti is not a not anymore a simple simple people in such a way that you can get charging of about four hundred dollars per megabit per second. Now with Satray coming up, it's a two digit per megabit per second. So that's uh, a challenge. Uh, uh, it only resorted to very high through with satellite any normal uh, HDS will probably have a, have a difficult time to reach that, uh, that that level of price so it's an interesting it's a twist uh, uh, a new twist and, uh, in Indonesia and uh, if we ever do uh, provide a, pass a new capacity over the region uh, we will probably do it on a VHDS uh, platform as well okay. so that's where we are Right. Now, Christian, uh, you mentioned earlier you're planning a new satellite J after you just launched your satellite just very recently. So things might be very good. Eh? Can you meet that price, $100 per gigabit? Well, I, I agree that this, this is a, uh, a challenging price for everybody, <laughs> for the whole industry. Um, now, you know, the, the new generation of satellite with software-defined payloads may be able to achieve that on a wholesale basis uh, under the, I mean, it, it all depends on volume, uh, um, you know, time, duration of uptake. Um, so it, it, it may be feasible, but I agree it is a, it is a challenging level uh, at this stage in of development of the industry. That said that, yes, it, it, does, it does set a benchmark However, I'm confident that the demand is so large that, uh, you know, the bandwidth will be absorbed at, at this price and there will still be, um, you know, opportunities to sell bandwidth at a higher price. Uh, but, but, yeah, I agree that it is, it is a benchmark for us. What we have seen is that our business model works very well. Uh, 
um, you know, this duality of uh, wholesale and retail business that we have. Uh, currently, we cover uh, 25 nations with, with our satellite. And uh, there is, you know, there is space for covering many more nations um, in, uh, in Asia or even outside of Asia. Um, so what we are eyeing at the moment is to move westwards, uh, you know, try to continue augmenting our capacity over Southeast Asia, but also we are eyeing South Asia, Central Asia. Uh, those are very interesting, even North Asia to, to some extent. Uh, so those are interesting places for us, especially with a software defined payload where the risk of laying your capacity is limited. Um, so, you know, you can, you can try um, in, in some new markets and see if you can open them up and then stagger with, uh, with more satellites later once you've opened certain markets. Uh, our plan is very aggressive. We, we uh, have plans for many more satellites after, um, after the second one. Um, you know, we think that the world at the moment should be like a sponge in absorbing the bandwidth, the, the, the broadband uh, bandwidth that uh, we would put over, over the developing world, especially uh, in rural regions, remote regions of the world. There is nothing special about our current market uh, that would prevent our business model from being spread to other markets. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we do have global ambition. I mean, it's still a long way to go, uh, but what we've seen is very encouraging. So uh, how far are you along in, uh, in the uh, process of uh, procuring your second satellite? Your, your first satellite was a Pondosat. You shared it with the JC set, right? So right. will this be your own satellite? You will operate your own? Whole with, whole the ambitions, with the ambitions that we have right now, we are considering uh, an entire satellite for ourselves. Yes. Um, and we are at the stage of uh, financing at the moment, as well as um, already design phase uh, with the uh, request for information from, from manufacturers and soon launching our, our request for proposal. Yeah. Now, all of you said that there's the, the demand is there. Uh, I think that's a consensus, right? Uh, that that uh, there, you know, broad. Uh, uh, what? Let's talk about what are the uh, applications that are driving demand in Asia. Uh, maybe Daniel, you could start. Yeah, actually, um, the according to our recent study with uh, the one company uh, research group, that that research shows that. Uh, the, the opportunity from a government side, such as the USO, still to be the most taking up uh, the parts, maximum maybe 50 to 60 percent of total data demands, mm -hmm. followed by uh, mobile backhaul and consumer broadband requirements uh, as per each countries. And um, the another application that we are uh, trying to see is that. Um, the, the maybe IFC and you know uh, the maritime reset, which is uh, re re relatively uh, large, affected by this pandemic. But we see uh, the uh, the regional commercial aero market will be uh, coming soon. Uh, but the, since the global IFC mainly uh, has the many uh, global player. Now, so local operator like us may need to focus on regional base, uh, regional base demands. Uh, today, uh, just only 15% of aircraft, uh, regional aircraft is currently equipped by the reset, but, uh, but uh, for offering you know, many potentials from, uh, for the growth in coming years with the most of the upcoming new uh, deliveries of aircraft to be you know, fitted with the uh, reset. So, but however, for sure, in short term, the pandemic should uh, uh, pressurize many of airlines to be, you know, put their IFC put on hold, but we anticipate the acceleration maybe uh, coming soon, uh, totally. And uh, for the application in, in NVSET is also, uh, we're trying to see the, um, the passenger connectivity on, on, on ferries over, uh, you know, Southeast Asian countries. For example, you know, Indonesia and Philippines has consist of a, a large number of uh, the islands for this, you know, large uh, archipelagic countries. The passenger ferries are an important, you know, transport 
in, in each country. So we estimate about the addressable market of uh, total 1,000 uh, ferries across the, the Southeast Asian country. Since uh, while we have about maybe 40 VCA connected ferries in uh, as of now. So we will see the those two um, regional, you know, uh, not a global uh, in market, but regional we, we, uh, that we focus on, we'll see the more growth uh, is coming on. Very interesting. Yeah, you mentioned two of the hardest hit uh, segments of the satellite industry during the pandemic, uh, which is maritime and uh, IFC. IFC probably more than maritime because, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, the cruise industry stopped, but uh, actually shipping still continued and uh, fishing and all that. And, and then passenger traffic, maybe inter-island, as you mentioned, in huge archipelagos like the Philippines and Indonesia. Now, Christian, uh, the coverage of your satellite is mostly water, right? In the Pacific. <laughs> Most, <laughs> uh, so are you also looking into the maritime uh, IFC? And then how do you see that markets going forward? Yeah. Uh I guess when we we designed our satellite, yes, it's true. You see a lot of water in our in our coverage, but in fact, we placed our our HTS beams primarily uh, centered on on lands, on mm -hmm. islands in the Pacific, uh, in Indonesia. Of course, there's a lot of water. Uh, you cover a lot of water by default when you cover Indonesia or the Philippines, uh, thousands and thousands of islands, uh, mm -hmm. but. Our, our conscious decision from the beginning was to provide broadband um, and to provide land broadband, right? So the maritime segment has come as an afterthought. Um, mm -hmm. It's really a secondary type of market for us. Um, we did not place a lot of attention on that market. So, um, you know, we do not offer a global or, you know, a, oceanic coverage really so we can't really compete with um, you know other companies going after you know, ocean liners or, or, or freight uh, transport what we really uh, focusing on is more I mean not really focusing but uh, what the kind of market we, we do address are like yachting um, inland waterways uh, you know ferries uh, work boats in port we have mm -hmm. some of those um and we don't refuse customers who are interested in that uh, but it's really not our focus at all uh, because you know we haven't made uh, we haven't discriminated our pricing between that industry and all land-based uh visa yeah. as long as they use the same antennas so essentially you know you are the you know i don't know it depends from customer to customer let's say one or two dollar per gigabyte even on the maritime world. Uh, so for us, it's not a very lucrative business because there's the, the number of boats that are equipped remains very small. By the time you equip a hundred boats, you would have equipped like 2,000 or 3,000 land-based customers, right, with the same price. So yes, we, we're okay to do that, but we've left it as a second, secondary market for us. And uh, we're really focusing on broadband delivery be it direct to premise, which is really um, what the, the satellite is designed for, or via mobile backhaul. Uh, we have a substantial amount of our business currently going through mobile backhaul, which in the end is also uh, land based uh, broadband supply. Right. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that topic and uh, ask uh, Adi about the broadband part. But just before that, let me just give a, a little. Uh, additional info here about the maritime and the IFC, the, the in-flight connectivity markets. All the studies that I've read or that's been published so far seems to uh, indicate that uh, that's, that's up for a recovery. It might be slower. It might take a couple of years, but uh, obviously some of the other companies have already been uh, uh, investing in that, like Biosat has gone into uh, maritime. You know, they used, they used to be in the IFC uh, part of it. Uh, and Intelsat, which went bankrupt, both GoGo. So uh, that certainly is still a viable market, but in a, in a, maybe the, it will take a little bit longer than the others uh, uh, to, to uh, achieve the, the levels that it was before. Now, Adia, you, your focus is broadband, right? Uh, all your satellites are really for broadband uh, uh, applications. Uh. Yes. 
most of our satellite, like uh, Christian say, is uh, intended to be broadband and basically uh, land-based broadband. Mm -hmm. uh, even though if there is an overspill, somebody else wants to use it for something else, we're not against that, but we will not uh, make a mass uh, substantial investment in providing a very niche market. The way we looked at it, it's actually the satellite market pyramid is the top of the line are mobilities, which is uh, the maritimes and the aviation, which you can have a charge higher than a normal business. And those probably would have to be global play because you can't have a regional play because aircraft goes anywhere in the world. Merchant fish, uh, merchant and fishermen now goes beyond territorial water. So uh, that is the niche where I believe uh, the people like uh, Viasat, Intelsat, and everybody else is aiming and that. But the middle uh, of the uh, of the uh, pyramid is actually we I call it terrestrial solution, whether it is a GSM or whether it's fiber optic, FTTH, it's, that's the one. So you have only the bottom part, which is uh, rural areas, um, remote areas where the terrestrial doesn't make any economic sense uh, yet, uh, uh, that, that is a room. But to do that, that is also the bottom of the economic strength. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very price sensitive. Uh, uh, without government subsidies, uh, it will be a very difficult uh, uh, business case uh, for retail. And the second situation is that uh, also uh, the solution, the, the, the challenges of continuous electricity in rural areas. So the way we looked at it, that is something we really need to address uh, beyond the high throughput satellite, cost of broadband going, uh, being pressed down to be able to reach the affordability is mm -hmm. the rural electricity. Uh, that is one of the reasons in my mind, uh, if you have to have a tracking antenna in those rural areas, you really depends on the uh, electricity availability uh, mm -hmm. as well. So that's why we're concentrating on uh, uh, land-based uh, fixed uh, uh, installation. Uh, and the market is there, but it's a very, very uh, difficult market without government subsidy. Now, how about cellular backhaul? How is that uh, market for you? Uh, well, th there is a market for cellular. We're also providing cellular backhaul. Right mm -hmm. now, we just got a contract to 1.7 gigabits per second for backhaul. Uh, again, those are for areas where there are... Uh, uh, such an amount of economic strength, maybe at the edge where the government has to provide certain help to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the goal is to, to, to get that. But there are areas where it's far from any economic sense to provide uh, a GSM coverage. Mm -hmm. And those are the things very perfect for, for, for satellite. And, uh, but that's, again, the pressure is price. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, 5G, uh, Adi. So what's in it for satellite? What's in it for you? <laughs> well, I, I don't know enough about the 5G for satellite. There's a lot of talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the question really now is in my market, which I know very well, we're still struggling to make all 4G. And mm -hmm. we believe that the 5G uh, will be uh, concentrated in Indonesia, at least in the first nine large cities. Mm -hmm. But there is a move from the government to, you, to move the extended C-band uh, uh, from the satellite into the terrestrial uh, 5G. Um, that is now under discussion how to do that. Uh, if it's only concentrated into the uh, metropolitan area for the next five to 10 years, then we can still use the capacity in other areas, which is, uh, we call it rural areas. So, mm. so those are the discussion that we have, uh, rather than uh, asking for the government for a full compensation. Uh, with a certain pandemic, each government now having uh, to save money and provide money to other things than just uh, uh, subsidy for big cities, whatever they call it. Right. So, 
we don't we, we're waiting for 5g there is no 5g yet de de deployed in indonesia uh mm -hmm. it's still uh in the very there are some trial run anything else but there there is no market so we'll wait for that and we're just a follower on the 5g now katie said you you demonstrated a 5g uh ground segment uh, thing at the at Connect Tech Asia last year, the virtual Connect Tech Asia last year, right? Yeah, yes, we have uh, in Korea, you know, we have about maybe more than 12 million subscribers already in uh, 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, uh, so in Korea, the Korea is one of the most connected country in the world. So we're not trying to do something demonstration in, uh, in Korea, but we are trying to do, uh, find a new application that can be used in, in other country outside of Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see, you know, um, the demand for the networks in form of, uh, which is hybrid solution for the convergence of uh, communications. Uh, as the, you know, you can see the different type of networks increase such as LEO, MEO, we have mm -hmm. uh, GEO and optical fiber network and mobile wireless network sometimes, wiper, microwave networks. Each has uh, different uh, characteristics. So I believe, uh, you know, the demand for the, this kind of hybrid solution that combines together will be uh, necessary in the future. So even if you, um, LTE and even 5G some, in some countries uh, has come, but, you know, mobile wireless network and optical fiber are still very difficult to be fully rolled out, uh, rolled out in the rural area especially in uh, the Asia, Southeast Asia country. So where um, satellite networks would be the essential and critical, but still it is considered uh, expensive uh, to the uh, mobile network operator. So we are um, currently uh, designing a uh, kind of uh, advanced developed solution that links uh, satellite networks to the other type of networks in hybrid form combined either in uh, throughput uh, with a dual, transmi uh, dual transmission or uh, switch over between them once one uh, becomes, uh, becomes uh, disconnected with the outage. And if this becomes on uh, demand uh, product, like on-demand product, like a paper use, we think uh, we can create a lot of demand from mobile network operator in Asia. So we will be uh, having some this year or so, we are planning to another one, one site a demonstration of this hybrid solution for uh, several European, you know, MNOs together with our local partner in, in Europe. We will be able to maybe some uh, present and update a result in the middle of uh, this year uh, during uh, maybe satellite Asia. Uh, we think this could be also applied to different satellite networks between, uh, for example, NGSO and GSO. If uh, it is necessary uh, to do so. Right. Christian, do you have any thoughts on 5G? Have you looked into that? Yeah, well, we, we, uh, we definitely have, um, you know, looked whether uh, this was a, a, an interesting opportunity for us. Uh, what we think is generally that 5G is a system that was designed to augment the spectrum uh, in in um, congested cities where spectrum was not sufficient. So essentially what you do, you reduce the cell size and you multiply the number of cells. Um, and the uh, dilemma is very different in rural areas that we mainly serve. Um, you know, you, you actually want to cover as many people as you can because there is a low uh, population densities in these areas. Uh, so I think 4G is a, is a much more suitable system for rural areas. But of course, there will be eventually a convergence between the two systems. What I've heard is that there will be kind of a merger of the 4G technology into the 5G so that we call it all 5G, but there will be a rural version of 5G so that you will have a unified uh, system and standard for urban areas and, and rural areas, but the 5G where we will be talking about in rural areas is very different uh, type of system, very, very different specs that is still made to cover as many people as possible with wide cells, but just a unified specs. Basically. And that's, of course, something we're interested in. Now, Daniel also mentioned uh, the new Leo 
uh, non-GSO, non-geostationary non, uh, satellite system, LEOs, BEOs, and everything else, uh, even HAPs, you know, high altitude platforms. Let me ask the whole panel, maybe starting with you, Adi. How do you see uh, the new Leo systems coming up? Do you see that as a threat to your business, or is it a boon? Or oh, uh, absolutely. We don't. I don't consider it as a threat. Uh -huh. uh, I consider that is a part of the space solution that you a lot of problems. Uh, there are a place for the Leo. There are a place for the Geo. Uh, the I think the. the 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 with new the the new STS allows you not to go back to the classical transponder version. All will be HTS, but you can change the coverage for broadcasting as well. So uh, we looked at it uh, as long uh, as it provides uh, cap uh, TCO, the total cost consumer uh, cost of ownership. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, the Leo can compete but I don't know whether they can, uh, that's the place. The secondly is that the cost per bits per hertz uh, from the Leo side, but it certainly provides a certain flexibility if you wanted to be able to uh, do mobility so that it travels everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the concentrations of the Leo, because most of them are in polar orbit, is in the high alt latitude, okay? North and south latitude. Uh, where it all bunched together. So mm -hmm. the where, where Indonesia is in the equatorial plane, so they will be spread out uh, pretty far from each other. Uh, that means uh, the tracking has to be uh, the most widest okay, uh, for, for all of them. That, that will probably have some impact to the number of capacity they are able to provide in the equatorial plane. So, uh, as long as uh, uh, they provide a good service, good cost per, per hertz, and the TCO will be able to match the ground, uh, the, the, the uh, what's called the geo systems. Uh, I don't, it, it has two niches. Uh, if I have a customer who wants to be able to travel north, south, east, west, beyond company Indonesia, we will probably uh, work with uh, Leo uh, to see whether we can provide that situation. But, for fixed land base, uh, it has to be uh, as economically as the next gen uh, uh, geosatellite. So that's basically where I look at it. Daniel, you know, uh, Hanwha, a, a Korean conglomerate, announced that they are uh, starting a Leo uh, constellation, about 2,000 satellites. So, do you have any thoughts on uh, Leos? You know, other satellite companies have invested in uh, Leo, uh, like Utilsat just announced that they're investing in OneWeb, for example. So. Okay, well, according to the uh, Korean government space industry roadmap, uh, there are about uh, 130 uh, satellite development planned by 2040, including, you know, satellite development and satellite navigation, GPS system, Korean uh, GPS system, uh, KPS, and maybe a disaster response or a space exploration to the moon. So KTZ also is planning to join this project and take some uh, part, parts for the, some of the, those projects for the ground system or operation of the network. Uh, the space and uh, satellite market in Korea is formed uh, mainly for public purpose these days and uh, vertical integration of uh, space uh, business has been active recently. So mainly in large companies, for example, Hana, you mentioned uh, is one of the biggest companies group in, in, in Korea for the space industry is trying to integrate key technologies and business related to the space industry by acquiring uh, some portion of, uh, uh, by acquiring uh, Fager, Hana Fager, and also invest some, some portion in a uh, Kaimeta system. So as far as an open resource uh, from the public uh, news, New uh, LEO constellation project um, have been announced by uh, them, Hanwha Aerospace. It is said that they launch a pilot, you know, program with the uh, initial uh, sets. I, I don't know the, how many uh, satellites will be in uh, 2023, but ultimately they plan to operate uh, more than 2,000 LEO sector in the future. But uh, there's no detailed plan yet. Uh, so this is something that I know the, all about the project. 
Now, do you okay. see uh, Leos as a threat, or as you said earlier, you might be part of it in the future? Yeah, I think uh, uh, NGSO constellation LEO, for example, is more like a business element that needs to uh, grow together rather than a kind of bane of uh, G GSO operator, as mentioned, Adi already mentioned. I guess uh, GSO and GSO will maybe split the market together, not just being you know taken up by one side. So according to the uh, recent report and uh, geo GSO demand in, in the major, major three Southeast Asian country will be taken up 50 to 65% total demand. But then, you know, remaining uh, 25 and 30 percent demand will be taken up by NGSO. So um, we and also we, we expect that individual country has demands to be at least uh, the tens of times than the current demands in the next few, uh, 10 years. We don't think uh, NGSO will simply replace the existing geo satellite. But, you know, we look at the you know demand application by the system GSO uh, HTS system may have a strengthening uh, government GSO project and consumer broadband, while the mobile uh, backhaul and enterprise network will be uh, GSO and NGSO to take some of their uh, respective shares. Okay. Christian, so, any thoughts on the upcoming Leo system? Some are already up there, and there are some already are on trials here in North America, like Starlink. Yeah, so, I mean, look, I, 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 we keep an eye on them. I think uh, generally what we've seen is, for instance, Starling, they address markets where we're not particularly present. Uh, I think they, they're really going after defense, mobility to some extent, as well as residential markets. We don't do a lot of residential. We do a lot of enterprise broadband, but not so much residential. Um, I think uh, generally... You know, when we do a back of the envelope based on the information we have, there should be um, the, the, the price point that they reach for bandwidth is, is not particularly uh, cheaper than, than what GEO can achieve today, let alone what we can achieve with VHDS later. My, my concern is basically on, on two, two topics. Uh, one is, um, you know, there are so many company is trying to get into that and uh, a different stage of funding and many of them will not make it if, okay. if, if maybe not, not, not any of them because it is a challenging business plan. I think the most challenging is actually utilization. How, how much of that constellation will be actually utilized? So that will lead to bankruptcies and loss of money for investors, which will affect the industry. When we raised money for Pacific One, I remember clearly people telling me that oh, they had invested in the 1990s in Iridium version one, they had lost all their money and therefore they, know, they didn't want to touch the, the satellite industry with the barge pole. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. The second thing is, um, you know, several of these projects are, seem to be almost pet projects for, for, for multi-billionaires like Elon Musk, like Jeff Bezos, um, you know, those guys could potentially pump $10 billion in this and, and not make any money out of that. And, you know, um, so, so, you know, that that's, could be a threat for us uh, because essentially they could be completely non-economically viable and yet, you know, spend billions of dollars that would eventually uh, affect us. What we see currently, for instance, Starlink has announced that they are subsidizing $2,500 per installation and taking $100 uh, of subscription per month. That's two years worth of subscription goes in 100% in some yeah. how, how sustainable is that unless they shift from that soon? So, yeah. In my understanding, is that some of these uh, satellites have only a lifespan of five years or so. So you'll have to replace them very quickly. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've covered quite a lot of ground and, uh, we're, you know, we could really go on and on here. It's very interesting. We've got this distinguished panel. But I'd like to use the last few minutes of this uh, very interesting uh, panel uh, for all of our panelists to briefly summarize. Uh, it seems to me that you are all very bullish. Uh, you, you've, got, you've gone through the pandemic very, very well and have very firm plans for the future. So can I ask each one of you just answer three questions, you know, uh, very briefly. Uh, what have you learned most from the pandemic? How do you see... Uh, what changes has been in your in the satellite industry that you see, and how do you see it uh, moving forward? Maybe we'll start with you now, uh, 
Christian. Um, well, what, what what we have learned is that uh, generally you have to remain flexible. That the black swan is always possible. Um, <laughs> that I think um, I like the example of the pyramid from from Adi. Uh, this is something that I believe in particularly as well. That if you address the bottom of the pyramid, it is challenging, but it's it's not going to move as much as the top of the pyramid. Uh, so going down the value chain is, I think, an important aspect for, um, and that's that's probably the next step that many operators will need to do, uh, whether through a franchise model, whether through a straight, um, you know, uh, uh, retail model. That's that's basically what we've seen, but we see that the, the, the future is very bright for the broadband, uh, the satellite broadband industry. Daniel. Yeah, the, the, uh, throughout the, the pandemic, actually, we had uh, impacts on uh, our you know, daily lives and also uh, some of the activities outside of uh, uh, travel to outside the country. But we actually achieved uh, performance uh, very well still. Uh, we were trying to do uh, focus on more you know, business uh, uh, opportunity to finding and meet the customer in next uh, a couple of months and to achieve our target goal uh, of the, uh, this year. So um, we actually mentioned that we are considering actually a lot of uh, various options to prepare for our future, including a new VHD system. And during uh, to make it happen, we are on a uh, study with uh, uh, a couple of uh, companies to study more about the future demands and uh, supply chains in the next 10 years. So we will see what will come, and we definitely overcome the, the pandemic, and we will be uh, successful with other parties uh, in, in our major uh, uh, market in Asia. Thank you, Daniel. Adi, final word? Well, I think what we learned from the pandemic, uh, at least from my point of view, uh, the demand for online increased substantially. Policy by the government is changing in pro getting all people connected uh, because that is a challenge into an archipelagic country like us. Satellite plays a very key role. Uh, now the fiber is being built, but we have also problems with underwater volcanoes that fiber get cut. We have seen many, many cuts. Um, so the satellite industry for during the pandemic waking up that everybody has to be a part of the digital society. That means the demand will keep on going. And uh, the changes of satellite is very simple. To, to be able to satisfy the bottom of the pyramid, your cost basis has to be very low. That's the, the name of the game. And we'll see whether the VHTS, the Leo, or anybody else can meet that bracket. Well, thank you, Adi. I think uh, I've learned a lot from this very, very interesting session. I hope we had more time. Uh, but the, the key takeaway I get here is the demand is there. You know, the, 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 the global pandemic has actually uh, furthered that demand. In fact, that was born by, uh, out by an article that I just read recently. It, it lists down some 10, or 10 major changes uh, in our way of life that the pandemic has caused. And about seven of them all involve some sort of, uh, you know, like um, more people uh, working remotely, which means more, uh, more bandwidth, uh, more IoT, more, more control over machines and, uh, and stuff, more remote uh, control uh, of, uh, of, of, of work and, uh, and, and systems. Everything is leading towards that. So uh, I'm glad that everybody uh, has managed this pandemic quite well, and then, and then, and that you know that we're almost at the end that right now. And uh, and thank you all for participating. And I'd like to thank this very distinguished panel uh, for for this interesting insights. And for all of you out there, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Virgil Labrador, editor in chief of Satellite Markets and Research. And please stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much for that, Virgil, and thank you very much, Pak Adi. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your insights and perspectives onto uh, what uh, 2021 is bringing for the operators here in Asia Pacific. Please do join us next week uh, when we'll be having a, an update on the, the, the risk situation here in Asia uh, with uh, various panelists from the insurance industry. Uh, that webinar will be brought to you by Marsh. So looking forward to an update on, on how the 
the year has been shaping up in the insurance industry and what we can look forward to going, going ahead. Uh, please do join us. Also, upcoming topics are all listed at APSCCSAT.com. That is the website that you should be watching this on. Um, just click on one of the other, uh, the other tabs up there and you'll see the schedule uh, of upcoming topics. Uh, we look forward to, to seeing you here again, hopefully soon.